Good morning, my friends. It's wonderful to have you joining me this Mother's Day morning. And I would also like to welcome you to our Safer at Home Sunday Sanctuary worship service. A few notes. First, often in the past, the women of the congregation have conducted the Mother's Day service. And since that's not possible this year, we have a special gift instead. My wife, Suzanne, and daughter, Christelle, will be sharing part of the service. Second, there are portions of the service arranged to be responsive readings. In those portions, Suzanne, Christelle, or I will read the sections in the teal-colored fonts, while you will read the portions in the yellow. This is a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us worship God. Sisters and brothers in Christ, we celebrate the love God gives us through the families, friends, and communities which receive, our, receive and share our love. On this Mother's Day, we give our thanks for our mothers who gave us the gift of life. We give thanks for all the women who have loved us and shaped us, comforted and encouraged us, taught us and believed in us. We ask your blessing upon these women, O Lord. May your love strengthen and support them each day. Grant them your peace and your wisdom, your faith and your grace. Anoint them anew with your Holy Spirit's presence and power. Thank you for your love and for family and friends with whom we share that love. Amen and amen. And now let us sing our praises to God. Would you please pause the service at this point and link to song number one on the site? And then please return to the service. Good morning, kids. It's great to have you here this morning. And I would like to spend a few minutes with you, okay? What I'd like to do, I would like to ask you, do any of you kids know what, what this is? Anyone know? That's right, it's a, it's a human heart, at least a plastic model of one. And this morning, I want to talk to you about hearts, but, but not this kind of heart. Instead, I want to talk about the, the loving heart. Um, sometimes two people love each other a lot, and that love grows and keeps on growing. And, and at some time, your mom and dad loved each other a great deal, too. Their love was not empty. Their love was full. And, and that love brought you into the world. That love brought you into the world as a baby. I think most moms have hearts that are just full of love. Our mother's hearts, they can be broken, and sometimes we break our mom's hearts. But, but often our mom's hearts are full, and they're happy, full and happy hearts. And, and they show us that love in a lot, of, a lot of little ways, you know, little ways. But they also show it in, in medium ways. Sometimes it's medium-sized love that they show us, right? Medium-sized love. And then there are also those, those very special times when they show us that love in giant kind of ways, giant kinds of ways. And, and so our moms show us their love in all kinds of different ways, big ways, medium ways, and small ways. And, and it's a mixture of all of those ways of loving us. What they're doing in, in showing you all of that love is that they're planting the seeds of God's love in you 
so that you can grow up to be a giant love giver, okay? So they're planting seeds in you so that you can grow up to be a giant love giver. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank and I praise you for each child of this church, those who are near and those who are far. I thank you especially for the love of their mothers. I thank you for helping them to teach their children about you, Lord, for you are the Lord of love. For we pray in your name, Lord, stomping our feet very loudly and saying, Amen. Now you guys have a great time with your moms today, okay? God bless. Love you all. Bye-bye. And, and uh, what I'd like you to do right now is pause the, the service and link to music piece number two. And then when the music piece is done, come back on for the rest of the service. Okay, great. Talk to you later. Bye. This morning's first scripture reading comes from the letter to the church in Colossae. May God bless the receiving of the sacred scriptures. And may Christ Jesus himself, the living word, speak to us through them. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience bearing with one another, and, if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so also you must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God through him. May God bless the receiving of the word through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Please join me for the prayer of confession. We praise you, O God, for your infinite grace given to us through Jesus Christ. Lord, you call us to clothe ourselves in the fruits of the Spirit. Forgive us if we've dressed instead in our own discolored attire. Lord, you've forgiven us. We're sorry for the reluctance to do the same for others. In our giving and forgiving, may our hearts be filled with gratitude and praise. For we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our crucified and risen Lord. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God, through Christ our Lord. Amen. We gather now for the offering. Give, and it will be given to you, a good measure. Press down, shaken together, and running over, will be given to you. For with the same measure you give, it will be measured back to you. Luke 6.38 The support of the ministries of our church is as important now as ever. As you are able, please give generously. Offerings can be mailed to Mantuish Waters Community Church, P.O. Box 69, Mantuish Waters, Wisconsin, 54545. Let us pray. Lord of the harvest, we ask you to bless both the gifts and the givers. Multiply the giving of our hearts a hundredfold. 
help meet our needs as we also seek to meet the needs of the church. Guide us all, guide us all in the work of your kingdom in Jesus Christ. Amen. And now please pause and link to song number three, and then come back and resume the service. Thank you. Creating God, we praise you for your nearness. We invite you into the midst of our mourning. Thank you so much for our families and friends and friends who are family. We thank you especially for the women in our lives. Our mothers, grandmothers, godmothers, and aunts. We thank you for all of those who helped mother us, raise us in the Christian faith, and help teach us right from wrong. We thank you for our teachers and Sunday school teachers who gave their time, energy, and talents to us. We're grateful, Lord, for the youth leaders, scout leaders, and choir directors who helped shape our lives. For all the woman, women who have nurtured us and loved us, strengthened us and sustained us. Lord, we thank you dearly for the women we silently name in our hearts now. We also know our God, this day is not one of joy for everyone. We ask your blessing on those who yearn to be mothers. Bring your comfort to those who recently lost a mother. Pour your grace upon mothers and fathers who have lost a child. We pray for those for whom motherhood is difficult and for those whose relationship with their mothers was strained or missing. For all of these, Lord, Enfold them in your tender maternal embrace. Support them in their grief. Bring reconciliation to those mothers and children whose lives, relationships have been wounded. Create within us all a place of healing and forgiveness. And may that place expand within us. We all pray, saying, Lord, hear our prayers. For we pray in the name of Jesus, who loves us, embraces us all, and who taught us to pray, saying, using the ecumenical version of the Lord's Prayer, let us join together and pray as Jesus taught us, saying, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. As earth, on earth as it is in heaven, give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Now please pause the service and use the link to music number four. Thank you. And please return to the service after you finish that song. Jesus, enlighten the eyes of my mind and my heart that I might proclaim your word with integrity, creativity, power, and love. Amen. 
This morning's second scripture reading is from John chapter 14, beginning with the very first verse. Listen now to the word of the Lord. And may God bless the receiving of these scriptures, and may Christ Jesus himself, the living word, speak to us through them. Don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. And if it were, were not so, I would have told you. I am going to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. You know where I go, and you know the way. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. And Jesus said to him, Have I been with you such a long time, and do you not know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How do you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I tell you, I speak, that I speak not from myself, but the Father who lives in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe for the very works' sake themselves. Most certainly I tell you, the one who believes in me, the works that I do, that one also will do. And that one will do greater works than these, because I am going to my Father. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything, in my name, I will do it. May God bless the reading from John's Gospel, and may Christ, the living word, speak to us through it. Amen. Jesus is going on, on a new journey, a journey to a new home. There's a young guy named Nathan. Nathan and his parents were driving cross-country to their new home. And, and they decided to, to drive both of their cars. And this caused eight-year-old Nathan distress. How will we keep from getting separated, he asked. Dad reassured him, we'll drive slowly. One car can follow the other. But, but what if we do get separated, Nathan persisted. Well, then, I guess we'll never see each other again, Dad joked. Nathan quickly answered, then I'm riding with Mom. Well, in today's scripture, Jesus is moving too. Although I hate to say it, I'm guessing Jesus would, in this scenario, be more like Nathan's mother than his dad. And most of us would want to take the trip with him. Jesus was with his disciples, sequestered in the close quarters of the upper room of a house. Jesus traveled to Jerusalem and the disciples, and he found this room in which they were gathering. John's Gospel then describes this night. Jesus says strange things, and Jesus does strange things. Um, Jesus starts out by acting like a house slave. He washes their dirty feet. And th then he says one of his close friends in the group is about to betray him. And then he sends Judas Iscariot on his way. He, he, he says he's going to be attacked. And Peter jumps in and says he's going to defend Jesus to the death. And then Jesus foretells Peter's threefold denial. He, he's speaking to them in a sacred space, in, the room, in a room that, that, and it's in that room that, that he tells them that he's going to be leaving. Not merely leaving on a little Galilean siesta, but, but, but really leaving. In fact, he told them he was about to, to die. He was confusing them now and, and frightening them. He, he said soon they were going to be separated because he was going to a new place. In fact, he was promising to prepare a place for them, a place to which he ultimately would lead them and bring them. Now, now I picture them in a cozy little room. Perhaps the, their place that night was almost cramped. But, but, but the picture I see Jesus painting for them is a very different kind of place from 
from the little room in which they, they currently are. It, it was an, an expansive place, a place with plenty of space for them all. And, and this night, though, they were in Jerusalem, the, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, says the scripture. Perplexed and frightened, they were waiting in the close quarters of the upper room. How many of you are beginning to feel as though you've been in kind of a cramped space in your own upper room lately? Or perhaps it's not cramped space you're feeling, but too much distance. There's some of both right now for us, isn't there? We've been in kind of a quarantine for, for two and a half months or so. We've been calling it social distancing. And in that sense, we're having to be separated from one another. My mother is in a place right now where two of her neighbors on her floor have just died of COVID-19. And the space between our place and hers right now feels very large. On the other hand, my children have come back to our home. The thousands of miles of space between us is now measured in feet and yards, and that feels really good right now. But, but that's not how it is for everyone. For some of us, it's, in, it's increased the social distance between ourselves and others. And if that distance has become too great, we're, we're sensing a deep need to be closer to loved ones. And if the distance is too tight, as is the case for some apartment dwellers in cities, and even for some people up here, then you're sensing a need to flee to, to some kind of open space. During this season of the red tide, we're becoming more and more aware of our comfort zones regarding personal space. Even before the virus, we've known times when when someone has crowded in and, and talked to you and, and they crowd in and, and, and they're really too close for comfort. And, and we say then that, that they violated our personal space. Now the red tide and social distance, the social distancing is caused exponentially increases our awareness of personal space. To, to think about the people, I'd like you to think about the people in your lives right now. For, for most of us, some live together with you. Your personal space between those people and yourself has, has decreased. Now think about others not with you and the space between your present place and theirs. The social distance between them and yourself right now may feel too great. The, the internet can only do so much. Pastor Lori Wagner, she says the coronavirus is also changing our perception of time. Um, she points out that space is defined in part by time. And right now, she tells us, time has slowed down. We've been so used to our fast pace and our internet clicking kind of world that, that we've become numb. We've been so used to our fast pace that, that our busy tasks splitting here and going there, and oftentimes at will, and now much of that's changed for us. We're spending our time differently, and, and as time slows down, we're becoming more and more aware of changes. We, we cannot run off to the restaurant. We, we can't go to the movie theater. It's out of bounds. We, the, the sports gatherings are shut down. We don't run over to our friends for a drink. And the kids, they're corralled, often shut off from their friends and, and their schools. We limit our trips to the grocers, and we're considering the health of, if we're considering the health of others, we, we mask up when, when we do go and, and we try to keep each other, keep out of each other's personal space. Our new hangout is home. And for some of us, that's a very lonely place to hang, especially if you're alone, literally. For others, it's awkward. A, a new sense of family, cooking together, sitting together, working together, both inside and out of doors. We, we've more time to be talking and reading in, in the same room oftentimes. And, and as we're closer, relational dynamics become clearer. For some, that means our relationships and our families are growing genuinely closer. For others, with, with more complicated, conflicted relationships, the conflicts are becoming more apparent. 
we other, if we're in those situations, we either confront the issues and resolve them or we run, you know, to the other room or, or outside or somewhere else, anywhere else, uh, any place else. Uh, Laurie says we're forced into a shared reality, sheltering against a shared invader. And, and we're relearning to value each other in new and surprising ways. It, it means learning how to express our love in new ways. It's causing us to find new ways to honor and respect each other's sense of space. And, and as we live in a sense of space which is both socially distanced and intimately confined, it also challenges and changes our spiritual lives. It's caused me to reflect on, a, on, a, on different places and spaces in, in my life across the years. And I've come to see different shapes of the spiritual geography of my life. The places and spaces in which we, we shape our spiritual geography, each place in which we live is part of that, and it creates for us a different sense of space and time and distance. The places and spaces of our lives are new and different chapters in the journal of our, our spiritual geography. Um, and as you read back through those chapters, you can see specific spiritual themes rising up from the memories. They're the ways we view and interpret the world and God's place in, in our world in a particular time in our lives. For, for instance, in, in my childhood, in, in the suburban rambler in which I lived in North Minneapolis, it, it created an insular spirituality. Um, it was an environment in which we lived with an illusion of control. We looked at our world through our suburban shades. Um, and, and those shades, they concealed places and spaces of violence and poverty and pain. Our spirituality, it was white and it was washed as our picket fence. It provided a space and a place and a base from which to grow. But, but its confines also harbored the necessary seeds of discontent to keep us looking further and deeper. An uneasy sense of unmerited comfort pecked at our conscience in, in that space. And, and as time went on, the mirrors of perfection into, into which we gazed, um, they revealed more and more places and spaces, stains and flaws, spidering cracks and, and large missing pieces. And, and, and and it, it started challenging us. From our front row family pew on Sunday mornings, we sang, we listened, we shook hands, we chatted, and then we bustled back off to what we thought, except for Christmas and Easter, was our real life. That, that was my suburban home. Our Princeton apartment and the shaded streets upon which we walked, it, it evoked an air of high-minded academics. In that place, there was a sense of broad but focused intellectual and theological space. Plato spoke to Augustine and we, as we parsed our Greek and, and wrestled with Karl Barth. <laughs> um, but for me, it seemed our headspace had not fully engaged the right places in, in, in our hearts. And, and neither our heads nor our hearts had yet bitten into the real smoking coals of, of life. The, the danger in this place and space was having one's knowledge outstrip one's spiritual obedience and experience, creating kind of a schizophrenic place in whose space we, we were trying to welcome a sense of God's spirit. In that place, I found myself trying to live in an adult place of mind, but I often felt yoked into a cramped emotional space with, with an immature child. Um, the dissonance between the two selves in me sometimes created suppression, other times repression, oftentimes denial, it, it, and, and most often maybe it created embarrassment. And at the best of times, at other times, but the best of times, I think, it, it brought a space into which a gentle place of humility really, really found its home. Our apartment in Southern California bathed under the broad open space of the sultry southern sun. In that place, the smell of bougainvillea, eucalyptus, and sunscreen fought to a draw. 
with the confining spaces filled with the odor of stale french fries, trash cans, and, and car exhaust. The, the screen space of Hollywood with its handsome muscled hunks and, and curvaceous airbrushed babes tried in vain to fully conceal the places where, where calloused, homeless, horny feet stuck out at sunrise from, from refrigerator boxes and in which later shuffled through the night space of the beach boardwalks of Santa Monica. God was up there in God's space, and we lived in a place of paradise uh, of sorts, which opened for you if you could afford to buy it, or, or at least buy into it. The, the sense of having an inkling of how the upper 3% lived was tempered, however, but by the awareness that, that even in that place of palm trees and suntans, one could finally n never fully escape that space where, where the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune w would finally pierce and strip away the physical, emotional, and spiritual insulators in people's lives. And as a result, the person, you changed, and, and you would experience a, a new place of solidarity with, with those you once believed were so different from yourselves. It, and that, in turn, op opened a space wh where the Spirit's breath could enter and, and begin teaching you what it means to really breathe, to, to live more as, as God intended. Our Panabode Cedar House on the edge of Frederick Sound in southeast Alaska, it leaked rain through open spaces. While well, the boiler cluttered and boomed in the closed confines of, of the, the furnace closet, until it finally exploded, literally. Uh, but until then, it kept us warm. The, the salty grit, misty mornings, and blustery storms created an almost mystic space. But it was rooted in, in the dirt of the village and the sea that, that surrounded it. On that island, it created a personal space for, for me, which was a rough and ready, ragged and rugged place. The, the cramped space of the tiny place called Cake was right there. And, and it was surrounded by an enormous sense of space where, where everything seemed to, on this absolutely giant scale. The sea rose and fell at your doorsteps. The mountains, they towered up from the sea. And, and the hemlocks and cedars, they dwarfed you. In that place, in the village spaces in, in the boreal rainforest, the, the rhythm of, of the native dance and drums it tangled with the explosion of fireworks and, and the slurred voices of, of staggering inebriates. In that small cultural ecosystem, living water duked it out with, with the bottled spirits in the sweet-smelling spaces of burning herbs, man. They, they fought with places of Pentecostal fires. But, but, but the crucible of that place, it birthed, so some of the deepest spaces for friendship for which one could ever hope. The space of God's spirit in that place seemed to breathe into you and, and move with the mists of, of the Alaskan tides. And, and finally here in our place on Echo Lake in another house of cedar, we weather the seasons, gazing at the brittle water in winter and and the soft ripple of mirrored sunsets in the summer. The, the empty spaces on the highways and pines in one seasonal space would give way to the, the, they give way to the fullness of festive activity in another. The seasonal dancers from the south, they weave their way to their places in the north as the, as the snow departs. Then the fisher folk cast their lines at their favorite places, some are silent paddlers who slide through the spaces on the surrounding lakes and, and streams. In other places, people pedal, finding space to roll in the forest they, they share with the hikers. In other places up here, the, the frothy young, they flip and spin and bounce in the, in the space behind roaring outboards. And, and the more refined and sedate, they sip beer and cocktails and, and pontoon parades along the watery space of the, the lake chain shores. In, in this place, the spirit competes with recreation. The Cathedral of Pines and the lure of the lakes tease some people away from the church's embrace. Others in this place, though, 
they discover that in seeking first the kingdom, one can see the beauty of the rising and setting sun more clearly. For them, the trees in the forest clap their hands more loudly and, and the taste of the lakes becomes so much sweeter because they're no longer trying to, to make them an end in themselves. I've not spoken, however, of perhaps the most crucial element in these places of the past and in these spaces of the present. Because even beautiful places without beloved people and even the best houses without good hosts can become barren haunts and forlorn landscapes. But within the places, the apartments, the cabins, and the houses themselves in which I've lived, my wife, Suzanne, created the space for our home in the place of our house. And without that space of home, my life would have had no shape. I would have had no base. My, my roots would have crept aimlessly about in an empty space like, like blind beggars until I, until I dried up and drifted away, I think. Milan Kundera called it the unbearable lightness of being. Life without a place, relationships without space for roots, experiences unconnected, uncommitted, ultimately devoid of meaning. It's not simply the space created by Suzanne, my wife, however, that, that made for me a bit of a pulse and palace out of our house. It was instead because of Suzanne, the mother. Often I think it's the mothers around us that form the space in the family vessels through which the spirit works best. Suzanne's touches in our homes, like the touches of my own mother and perhaps like those of your mother's, um, have often been humble and straightforward. A bouquet over here, a garden there, a seasonal decoration hanging, or a savory soup or a wonderful steak. Um, it's not the external place, it's not these wonderful and tasty externals, though, which do the shaping. It's the spirit in which the mothers among us do them. It's transformative. They create a sense of space and boundaries in our place that, that shape our understanding of the richness of love. And it's that spacious richness which creates our families and, and, and which in turn, as it is shared and multiplied, creates the family we, we call our church. Before Jesus physically left his, this place, he made a promise to inhabit the space he left behind through his Holy Spirit with us. He also vowed to create a place for us on the other side of the, the, that fil thin film which, which now separates us from that reality existing as a, as a parallel paradise across from our present place. One of Jesus' last earthly activities with his disciples was to wash their feet. That, of course, is the job of a servant, actually a slave. Not, not a Lord, not the Prince of Heaven, nor the Son of God, or, or so we would have thought. And when Jesus says he's going to prepare a place for us, a space for us in, in his kingdom realm, it, it's another foot washing, isn't it? Well, like a mother excitedly preparing for the return home of her children, Jesus is doing the, the little things to, to personalize each of our homecomings. But he knows, and we know. It's not how he decorates the spaces in that heavenly place that matters. It's not the streets of gold, the, the gates of pearl, and in fact those images of the place um, feel kind of hollow to me. Without him, even his richest treasures would have an unbearable lightness of being. The furniture, geography, architecture of heaven ultimately don't matter. What does matter is the fact that Jesus, he is there. That he'll come to get us when our time comes and that we'll be with him. That's what matters. Friends, that's what matters. That's ultimately all that matters. 
Lord Jesus, prepare us for the homecoming. Amen. Mothers and fathers, kids, would you please pause and play song number five, after which would you please return for the parting benediction. Thank you. Would you please join us online at Mantwish Waters Community Presbyterian Church, mwcpc.org, next Sunday at 930. Until then, have a blessed week and, and have a precious Mother's Day, all of you. God bless you. And now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and grant you his peace, both now and forevermore. Amen.